And without further ado, um, I, I welcome Diego and thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, both Valentin and Eric, for this initiative and also the invitation uh, for me to be presenting in this context. Um, now, a, a bit confused because uh, with me, while well, we have been setting up a second event, uh, and this is going to be about anxiety. So today was more about mental balance. So just to be clear, I mean, I can I can switch because I'm ready with, with either one, but for the ones who really want to go a little bit deeper into the whole question around anxiety, I really welcome you uh, for next Thursday when I will be presenting on anxiety specific and stress and the correlation with mental well-being. Uh, and today we will be looking a little bit more about uh, mental balance. And okay, so thanks, Eric. <laughs> so um, I would like to begin with my presentation by basically asking you first and foremost, why are you here? Why are you participating in this event? And uh, we have obviously a chat available. And so please enter your answers or your ideas. Why are you here into, your, into the chat? To learn something new, great. Also su support community and gain new insights, somebody was saying. Uh, so somehow I suspect that learn methods to relax beside work and then also this ex exceptional situation, the pandemic is causing challenges to the lifestyle we had. And then also it's a challenging time. He yeah, has feeling exhausted for so many more methods to learn. Um, so uh, it's obviously that in order to participate in something, you need to have a motivation, you need to have an interest. And so what is it that is so important about being uh, learning something new, or also to find balance or uh, start to understand your uh, mental system. And so I will be exploring exactly that. And the way I'm going to go about it is I will be obviously presenting a little bit. The idea was not only to just have a presentation and then pack up and go, but also have a Q and A at the end. So we will be uh, first having maybe a 45 minutes uh, presentation and then another 45 minutes of opportunities to really ask questions about um, what it is that you'd like to know a little bit more or go a little bit deeper. Now, before I uh, start, I would like to ask you again, and please uh, enter these answers into the uh, chat, is what is the most fascinating phenomenon for you? What is most fascinating? Life, nature, quantum mechanics, learning, creativity, the rainbow behind my shoulders, yes, thank you. Uh -huh. Nature plus one, human brain, fungi, obviously, somebody's a fungi researcher, soul, living things, the universe, the ocean. Well, you're obviously already sort of on track in where I am going with this question. And for me, it was very clear that from an early age on, I was extremely fascinated by the fact of us being conscious. It is not enough to just have a brain, because we all know that the brain without consciousness is dead. But something else is happening in when we are having consciousness present. And for me, it was very clear, and this is also probably why I ended up in the Federal Institute of Technology. Because I thought that by studying physics, I might even understand what it is, what the universe is. And the more I started digging there in these questions around what is reality, it became clear that consciousness is actually creating reality. There is no phenomenon out there that we can observe without our consciousness being present. So this is why, for me, it became paramount to start exploring deeper what is actually consciousness. 
Now, obviously, the mind is somehow related to consciousness. And I wasn't the first one, obviously, that was asking this question. And even Socrates came up with the idea and the understanding that the mind is everything. What you think, you become. And obviously, that opened up a whole lot of more questions. So would it really mean that if I understand the mind, then I understand what is reality and how I want to move on? And so for me, pharmacology was one of those avenues that I thought by studying and getting deeper into, because obviously there are these fascinating substances that have an effect on the mind, so-called mind-altering substances. And so by studying that, I would better understand what is consciousness. Unfortunately, in my whole studies, uh, not even once we were talking about consciousness or the mind. And it became very clear to me that it, we have a complete wrong understanding of what is actually the mind and these mind altering substances were not really fundamentally changing the mind because even a person under heavy influence of alcohol or heavy duty drugs is still having something which is present even fundamentally when the person is inebriated, which is the wish to be happy, the wish to be well. And my first question was basically going into that. Why are you here is not just because you want to learn something or because you want to sort of find new methods. It's basically because you do not want to suffer and you want to find, and this is all of our studies, all of our explorations have to do with the fact that we do not want to suffer and we want to explore and find ways to be well. And obviously we have created a society and a whole system that looks at outside when fundamentally happiness and well-being comes from within. And so this for me during my studies became even more clear that we need to understand better. So we have a wrong concept of what is actually, uh, let's say, causing well-being. We have a wrong concept about mind-altering substances because they're only perception-altering substances that do not change mind in its most fundamental aspect. So during my studies, obviously I was not so aware, but Further on, I became clear that these are all these states that we do not want are unhappy when we're stressed, when we are frustrated, when we're angry, when we're craving, when we're desirous, when we're fearful and anxious and even depressed and irritable or have a weak mind that just crumbles at the first uh, challenge. And so what drugs mostly do is basically they bring you from a level of really deep in here, they bring you a little bit up. And what we're talking here are these negative and unwholesome mental states. But what drugs mostly do, they bring you maybe to decrease by a shift of obviously your um, attention and particularly also by your perception, they bring you basically up to neutral. But there is a whole domain that is above this neutral line which are these positive and wholesome mental states. So for me, my life has been about finding out what are those positive mental states, wholesome mental states, and how do we cultivate them? And in the West, certainly uh, 40 years ago, 30 years ago, this was basically uh, a non-topic. It was just about re removing the negative and the unwholesome. But all of us would like to be here in the positive, wholesome mental states of being happy, of being joyful, of being open, thriving, flourishing, even having compassion, benevolent, balanced, at ease, and basically resilient and strong minds. But most of us did not know where to look for that. Certainly 30, uh, 40 years ago, it was basically a non-starter to look here. So I had to, de I decided then to stop. And for me, up to uh, after doing my work at the, um, uh, finishing my studies, and then I worked at the pharmacy, it was during the time of the Zurich drug scene, the blood spits. And my pharmacy was on the road, the Langstrasse, and I had the whole heavy drug scene in the pharmacy. And that's 
illegal drug scene, but of course there is also the legal drug scene that runs on prescriptions. And so for me, it was very frustrating. And then I decided, okay, I need to do something where I can really do something much better, much more uh, beneficial to help people. And I signed up with an organization called Doctors Without Borders, Médecins Sans Frontières. But there's also something called Pharmacia Sans Frontières. So I signed up with them. And then I ended up working two years in Nepal with beggars. Those people who had lepra, tuberculosis, and parasites were the main uh, ailments that these people were having. And I don't know if some of you have seen lepra or maybe even smelled lepra. It's a wasting disease. And so here I was working with these people that were basically rottening in, uh, in their body and they were still extremely happy. Not only happy, they were actually joyful in ways that I did not expect them. And even one of those beggars said, why are you coming here? And I said, well, I'm coming here to help you. And I said, we don't need you. We're much more happy than you are. And I had to concur with him. He was right. They were much more happy. So here I was working with these people whose bodies were rotting away, but the minds were strong, were resilient, were balanced, were at ease, were benevolent. When back in Switzerland, I was working with people who had physical well-being, but were rotting away mentally. So this opened up a whole new domain. And then I signed up where, uh, in a study, and that was my second study. I learned Tibetan, and then in Tibetan, I learned Buddhist dialectics and methodologies, because it was clear that they had something that we were missing, which were an understanding of how the mind works and how to cultivate positive qualities of the mind. And in Dharamsala, and back here, when you look at the yellow wall in the back, that's actually the compound of the Dalai Lama, where he's in exile. Um, and he invited every two to three years scientists to explore with him the questions such as consciousness or uh, destructive emotions or what's happening when we're sleeping, when we're dreaming and when we're dying and what is attention and focus and, and clinical. Uh, so there were Nobel Prize laureates uh, that were going up there and I got dragged in first as a translator and a sort of bridge builder, but then also as a moderator. And in the end, I actually ran the institute that is building the research around these. And we not only had private meetings, but also public meetings here in Zurich in 2010, for instance, this picture was taken and it's the Mind and Life Institute. And we have published a lot of books, people, some of you might know, John kabat Richard Davidson, Daniel Goldman, uh, and others who were really at the forefront of understanding what is a positive, healthy mind and what are not so healthy mind traits. And so to take a step back, I'd like to sort of explore what is actually meant by science. I mentioned there were scientists going out there. And of course, science is coming from the Latin word of scientia, which means knowledge. And it is a systematic enterprise that builds and organizes knowledge in the forms of testable explanations, as well as predictions about the universe. Now, when we talk about the universe, we should not just think about the physical universe. It's also obviously part of what we are, which is experiencing beings. And so this definition does not specify how this knowledge is gained. And in the normal context, we think that this is what science means, which is basically just natural science. We look at a phenomenon such as a bacteria in a petri dish or viruses in this context or whatever methods that we have to basically explore deeper uh, about an object. We could also use a telescope as an example. And so these tools help us to understand a little bit deeper the correlation between different forms that we can observe outside of our mind or outside our body. But this is also a way how we can explore reality by looking inside. And for me, these two methods are not mutually exclusive. They're actually complementary. And it's clear in the context of mental well-being we, and also the pandemic now, there are all these different aspects, an external dimension, but also an internal dimension that is playing with our fixed 
mindsets and experiences. And for me, this image is basically the uh, iconic image of how these two sciences can come together. An expert in looking inside with an external exploration. And nowadays we can say that there is a science of contemplation. But science, contemplation can also be a science. Is when we have the telescope of our own attention, precise, stable, we can actually penetrate much deeper into the workings of our own mind. And how did that all start? In 1992, when I was already up in, in this uh, northern part of India, there were a few yogis way up in the mountains and uh, a bunch of scientists came and wanted to explore what is different with expert meditators. And they also came to our school and I show you this image into uh, when they came to our school, uh, Francisco Varela uh, was one of the scientists present and you can see him sitting on the chair with his blue hat and they came to say, this is how we research compassion and the mind. And you can see that all these Buddhist uh, students, they're all laughing. Why is it that they're laughing? It's not because Francisco looks so funny with his blue hat. They were laughing because it did not make any sense to look for the mind in the brain when it is actually in the heart. Nowadays, we know that more than 15% of our nervous system is actually outside the brain. And a lot of our information that we get is not through the brain, it's actually through this external part of our nervous system. And when it comes to emotional regulation, it all has to do with your gut feeling, literally, and also with your heart and the uh, tension that you feel in your breathing apparatus and so forth. So these are not to be belittled understandings. And so with this in the background and these long-term practitioners, and I was fortunate enough also to be among the guinea pigs that were brought into the lab to be explored at what is actually different in long-term practitioners, basically long Olympic athletes of introspection. Another person, this is Richard Davison with uh, Machu Ricard, some of you might know him. He's a molecular biologist who became a monk in the 60s and has been uh, a very prolific writer as well as uh, part of the research. And this is actually a research that we're doing at currently, and it's, it's ongoing, at the EPFL in Lausanne, uh, where robotics are being used in visual virtual reality to see how the identity of self is being affected by virtual reality, as well as how we can use that to uh, help people that have problems with being in the body, finding back into it. And so the research is quite prolific. Uh, over, over, and this is beginning in two, the year of 2000, maybe 10 or eight publications a year had the word mindfulness or meditation somehow in the publications. But over the last 16, 17 years, we can really see that a lot has happened because it was found to be extraordinarily beneficial, particularly in the clinical context, as well as in leadership and uh, personal development that has to do with developing these qualities that have been found that meditation are beneficial. Now, let me just point two critical researches out that were found to be really groundbreaking. And this is a publication that came out in 2004. Up to then, it was thought that gamma amplitude synchronicity only happens in sleep. And here for the first time, it was observed that long-term practitioners also were able to develop these gamma synchronicity, high amplitude gamma synchronicity during waking state. And it was thought that high amplitude gamma synchronicity was only happening when the brain is actually consolidating itself. It is in a learning process and it's consolidating all the information uh, in the sleep. But here it was found that actually basically brain recovery is also happening in waking state. 
particularly when the meditation is being started. And here you can see these electrodes basically firing up when the person moves from resting state into the meditative state, which is basically a sign. Now you start meditating and this starts coming up. So this revolutionized basically the understanding of how do we think a brain is operating, functioning, and particularly what are the benefits of meditation? Now, of course, there are other areas that are being affected by that, but here you just wanted to show you, it's not that the brain only fires up and otherwise it's dead, but this is obviously an image methodology to show you that there are differences in, on the right side, a novice who's trying to meditate or is addressed or a person that is a practitioner that is meditating or is addressed. Another area that is also important to understand is that mindfulness practices lead to increases and changes in regional brain gray matter density. And it was shown that in certain particular areas on over a period of only 14 days, 30 minutes per day meditation or practice, that means seven hours of practice has already a benefit in certain areas. And what kind of areas are these in the brain? These are areas that are responsible to a large extent with emotional modulation. So when we talk about stress, obviously stress is a sign that some emotional stuff is happening, of course, physiologically too, but some emotional stuff and is indicates that somehow with practice, you learn to modulate much better your emotions and the stress. So we can actually say, uh, and there's obviously much more, there's zillions of research papers now being published about that, but we can actually say nowadays that the ongoing conversation between scientists and let's say expert uh, inside researchers, the contemplatives, continues to shape and change the way we think about and understand both the brain, the mind, and actually how to cultivate positive qualities. And I'd like to sort of dig in a little bit deeper. Why is that so also important? And an analogy that I would like to use, particularly now since we're talking in an environmental context, is that the results and the behaviors are like the iceberg that is the part that is sticking out of the water. And we all know that much more is actually happening under the waterline, under the surface. And these are the feelings and the thinking process. And we can't really see it from outside unless we are experts. So behaviors are actually determined by what is happening under the waterline. And results, if we really want to get results moving, then we need to really look at our behaviors. But behaviors themselves are actually determined by what we think and what we feel. And what we feel determines what we think. And what we think determines what we feel. So there's a strong correlation and so-called interdependence between thinking and feeling. And both actually have an impact on how we behave and the results that we're creating. Now, when we talk about our assumptions about happiness and focus, I bring forth a paper that was published in 2010 uh, at Harvard University. Uh, this was by Matt uh, Killingsworth and um, Gilbert. They looked at what is actually a wandering mind. And it became very clear that researching that wasn't so easy. And so what they did is they developed a little app uh, it was an iPhone app and they were pinging people throughout the day. What are you doing right now? What kind of actions are you engaged in? What are your thoughts? What are you thinking right now? Are you present or are you thinking about something else or you'd rather be doing something else than being here? And what are the feelings that are also present? And so during their daily activities, they were asked these questions. And so they got a whole range of basically plotted along a line of about 65% of being happy or being well. Uh, and so 
obviously when somebody's sleeping and resting, you don't really know if you're happy or not. But when you're working, when you're at the home computer or commuting or doing household work or reading or basically not doing something special, you're basically all aligned along about two thirds of happy. If we say 100% is completely happy and ecstatic. Uh, interestingly, the talking and conversations is quite high, exercising also, and obviously uh, lovemaking is also considered to be one of those activities that uh, we presumably are quite happy about it. The problem is what happens when you're thinking about somebody else when you're making love or when you are actually not really present. And this is when they started analyzing it deeper, they explored and found out that the different ways of presence, some people were having an unpleasant mind wandering. They were not really able to control or keep their mind engaged because they have this ongoing interfering chatter of their own mind. Or they were feeling distracted. Or they were constantly looking at their phone or they were distracted because some emails were coming in or noise was present. Now, neutral mind wandering was considered to be okay-ish. But then, of course, most happy you seem to be when you are not mind wandering, when you're fully present. And so the deeper analysis really revealed that people are less happy when the minds are wandering than when they are focused. Now that's something that we're constantly facing. We're constantly actually challenged to be basically distracted with something else, with something else. And this is actually true for all activities, even the least enjoyable activities, even doing your dishes. When you're mentally fully present, you're actually much more happier than when you're doing thing things that you actually supposedly like to be doing, but you're not even present because your mind is wandering. And so it was said that 53% of our time, the mind is not even present, is doing something else that is not relevant related to what we're supposed to be doing. And this is actually the a, a, a profound finding was that mind wandering is generally the cause of unhappiness and not the consequence, which means we are actually mind wandering and that leads to be unhappy. And it's not because we are unhappy that we're mind wandering. And here we have a real angle point to start looking at how can we create happy minds or feeling well. And so a third finding was that people, what they think is a better predictor than what they're doing. Because we can't really see what the person is thinking, it is much more difficult to see and understand. And it doesn't really matter if you're cleaning the toilet or if you're cooking your favorite meal or if you're uh, having an engagement with somebody. Much more important is what you think. Now, how can we control that? How can we guide that? How can we develop that full presence of our mind? And so it's clear that the most powerful distractor is not the noise around us. It's this inner chatter of our own minds that drives us basically nuts. The feeling of I'm missing out on something or something else I could be doing rather than here. And we forget completely to be fully present. So when we look at neuroscientific findings, we can basically say, and this has to do with the uh, neurogenesis and the plasticity of the brain, is brains do change all the time. In the past, it was thought that the brain basically grows up to about end of adulthood. And from there, it's basically downhill. We're just pruning our nerve cells and maybe myelating a little bit more or less, which are processes of consolidating uh, information tr uh, transfer. But in the late 90s, it was found that Neurogenesis is a part of our brain that has to do with learning. It's happening in the hippocampus, which is a particular part of the brain and is key for learning and building new connections and new parts of the brain through 
developing new cells, stem cells that grow into these parts of the brain that we're using. So the problem, however, is that most of the time our brains are changing unwillingly. We're not guiding this process. We just let it happen. We're letting our cells be distracted by this and be distracted by that. And of course it builds neural uh, infrastructure, neurons that are growing, but unwillingly. So we're basically building a nervous bra brain system that is not really beneficial for us if we're not controlling and guiding it. And this has huge consequences. And I'd like to sort of point at four key consequences that are that we can know that we know now that are problematic in view of this focus or the lack of focus or an ongoing distraction that is happening. And at the end, I will also present four ways of how to counteract that. So the first consequence of that is distractibility. We all know that, and we all know that very from first person perspective, that we are experiencing that all the time. How much are we distracted? We're distracted by external stimuli, but we're also distracted by this internal stimulus or the lack of internal stimulus creates a void and we start basically just looking for these distractions. What's happened to social media is one of the worst because we're constantly triggered to look somewhere else. And that means that actually 47% of the time we are not paying attention to what we're doing. We all know that. But that's a new phenomenon that we have a serious increase in ADHD in children. That's not something that is just basically we have better uh, diagnostics methodologies, but it's, it's a clear indication that over the last 15 to 20 years, the ADHD is like a rampant uh, pandemic in children and of course in adults too. And this is the graph that I wanted to show from 87. Uh, it really has grown over 10% now uh, and uh, about 20 years ago, it was only five to 6%. Another phenomenon that has been really related and found to be correlated to this is loneliness. 76% of middle-aged Americans, and this is a research that has been done in the US particularly, uh, feel that they are lonely. And not just a little bit lonely, but moderate to high levels of loneliness. To the extent that this results in a higher mortality than even obesity. People over 60, the ones who have made it, have a higher chance of dying when they feel lonely, when they feel isolated, when they than when they have obesity. That's in the International Psychogeriatrics. This research was published in 2018. The third of these consequences has to do with this negative self-talk and depression. This is an, uh, a phenomenon that was not around 30 to 40 years ago in youngsters. Between 2014 and 2019, there is a 33% increase in five years of people with depression and this negative self-talk and also low self-esteem. Um, the problem particularly is now that it is happening in teens. And this is at the Center of Disease uh, Control in 2018, was, this uh, was published. And what is really dramatic is the increase of suicide, particularly among the young. That has doubled over the last 10 years. It's related to this negative self-talk and the depression. And a fourth dimension is, what shall I do with my life? This whole question of purpose and meaning. And we're all facing these questions. What is this all about? But where do you put your interest on? How do you engage? And so people in their 60s with low purpose, if you basically stopped your career as a worker, you have a double, twice as high likelihood to die within five years than if people with, who have still a purpose, even if it's just grandchildren or learning a new hobby 
or uh, being with friends. And this is the research that is just basically uh, validating what I'm saying uh, in, in view of all this uh, data. Just wanted to show you that, that it's not just something that I've been fishing from somewhere as a good idea, but it's, it's really well documented. Now, obviously that brings up the question, well, what can we do? And here I would like to present the four pillars of a healthy mind. And the first pillar is awareness. And this is one part why I'm doing these presentation is really draw your awareness to what we're talking about. Why is it so important? What can you do about that? And so obviously what you can do about it is build a muscle that helps you with focus as opposed to build a muscle of distraction, which is what we're doing most of the time. So building the mo uh, muscle of focus, also resist distractions. When you notice that there is this impulse to just reach out for something that distracts you, well, try to resist it. Fortunately, we have established our habits that are so strong. So we just get lost in that. And then build this meta-awareness. And these are all things that in a contemplative practice context is what you're building up. Get to know and understand what your mind is doing. Lack of meta-awareness is basically when you're reading a book and you do not remember anything five pages down the line. You basically have just a lapse of meta-awareness. And meditative techniques have really been building this, but there are other techniques also that could help with this. And then if we want to really shift, we cannot shift without this present, which is awareness. It is crucial for transformation without intention. This is why I asked you at the beginning, why are you here? It is also an understanding of, oh, wait a minute, something is not quite right. I need to build something else. And developing this awareness will guide you at least in a maybe proper direction if you get the proper tools also. And then this is crucial for transformation. So awareness is the first pillar to build. The second pillar is connection. And this has been particularly challenging now in the context of this pandemic. We are at home. You know how that suddenly feels, that we're not engaging with others. Uh, and we also don't know quite what nurtures harmonious interpersonal relationships. It's not just about hanging out with your friends, but you find your friends and you're engaging and you're being stimulated with uh, people that are sort of like-minded to you and you're nurturing harmonious interpersonal relationships. One way how we can do that is like building appreciation. Relationship also is not only with other people, but also with ourselves. And it's clear that there are some qualities that are fundamentally important for building connection and uh, harmonious interpersonal relationship, like kindness, compassion, and a positive outlook. But when we're kind of like dragged into this vortex of the negative thinking, it's becoming even more difficult. So awareness is the first step that helps you to explore and understand what's happening in yourself and then build up your connection with that. And then you build up the next step, which is insight. Insight is also, and I'm specifically now uh, drawing your attention to this narrative that we have about ourselves. I'm not good enough. I suck. Oh, this is too difficult for me. Or I am basically stressed out. And it's again, me, me, me. When in fact, with this other connection, we are moving away from that self-centered attitude. That's why kindness and compassion and a positive outlook are included in that. But when we are not aware that we have this negative narrative, 
these negative narratives we start taking as true descriptions of who we are. I am not good, I'm a loser, I'm a waster, I am uh, stupid. Whatever it is that we're saying to ourselves, if that becomes sort of our truth, we then start building the perfect building, fertile ground for depressions. So a healthy mind is a mind that changes this relationship with the narrative. It's not that this will immediately disappear. But once you start building up your healthy mind, you start shifting this narrative. And then, of course, the purpose. What? Why are you doing what you're doing? That's one of the most fundamental questions. Quickly, we will probably respond saying, well, we're just doing it because we want to build a career, or we want to earn money, or, but why is it that you're really doing that? And so once we start connecting all our activities to the overarching sense of our purpose, of our life's purpose, of what it is that we really want to be our legacy when we leave this planet, what do we want to leave behind? Do we want to have a complete destruction behind in our wake? Or do we want to feel like we have contributed to the well-being of others? And so once we start broadening our actions, this is crucial for our healthy minds. And to start basically bringing this presentation to a close, and I know I've been full on, uh, it is important to understand that self-discipline actually outdoes IQ. It's not who is the smartest that is successful, but who is best able to manage their own emotions. And this is a research that was published in 2005. It's a bit uh, dated now, but nevertheless, it is a very important uh, research that has actually launch the whole field of positive uh, emotional research or positive psychology. So self-discipline now does IQ in predicting academic performance of adolescents. And there's a beautiful, uh, quite um, touching video series on the marshmallow test. So check it out what the marshmallow test was, which was little kids that were presented in a research context with a little piece of marshmallows in front of them. And it was funny to see them, how they were kind of like struggling, but was, it was given them the marshmallows and they were told, I'll be, the researcher was saying, I'll come back in about five minutes and I'll give you a second one if you haven't eaten the first. So these kids start really struggling to control their impulses to just eat this little piece of marshmallows. And 30 years later, they looked at the same kids and it was clearly correlated to the ones who were able to postpone immediate gratification to their academic and life fulfillment. The ones who did better at that were also much more happier in the course of their life. And so what are the factors and this is the healthy mind platter that uh, a friend of mine, Dan Siegel, developed. Where, uh, and there are basically, we can say there are seven external factors that lead to a healthy mind. One is don't forget to sleep. Sleep is such an important part. And what is it that is important about the sleep? Is it the length? It's not the length, it's the quality. Now, if you're sleeping with an electronic device beside your head, or you have been watching uh, blue light till just before going to bed, your sleep quality will be compromised. So try to have about two hours before you sleep, uh, screen off time. I know some will be laughing, it's impossible, but this is clearly correlated to your sleep quality. It's not the quantity, it's the quality. And of course, also physical time, exercise, a cardiovascular, not just basically uh, a little bit of a stretch, but really get the body going because also oxygenation of all your important organs, foremost the brain, is important. Focus time. Do you really have time where you focus on that what really interests you? 
or are you just focusing on the stuff that you think you need to do? And then also key nowadays is connecting time. Are you connecting with somebody, some people, some friends, or, or you're not connecting because you're basically just WhatsApping to them? And then also play time. When was it the last time that we really have played? It's particularly important for people above 20. And then downtime, when you're doing nothing, not just sitting on a beautiful bench after you walked up to a mountain and then you fill it that time in with your uh, mobile phone, but just sitting there, do nothing, just observe downtime. And then of course, in time, which is what I'm talking about, is the quality of exploring the inner process of your own mind through either meditation or other uh, means that really bring you in. Yoga can be one of them, but it's not as in intentional in yoga or Tai Chi or other of those uh, sort of contemplative techniques. And then, of course, very important is what do you eat? And of course, I'm an advocate of plant-based. So the more plant-based you eat, the less you're actually hammering your body. And when we talk about this topic that uh, I like to sort of bring up is mental fitness. How do we build mental fitness? And mental fitness, we can define it as your capacity to respond to life's challenges with positive rather than negative mindsets. And that has a huge impact. It has an impact on your performance, be that as a student, be that as a professional, be that as a sports person. Whatever you're doing, you will be much more effective once you know how your basically infrastructure is working, your mental software is working has an impact on peak performance. It also has an impact on the peace of mind and the wellness, as well as healthy relationships. And these three are key for us to become mentally balanced. And of course, lasting positive change requires not only one thing, which is what I have been conveying to you now is mostly insight. Some things that I might have been saying might be self explanatory, others might be new, but they're all basically only 20% because you're not really building the mental muscle on how to. And this is where I would like you to invite um, um, to maybe participate next Thursday when I'll be talking much more about how to build this mental muscle in view of anxiety and stress. But success requires obviously intensive initial practice. It is impossible to defeat a gang of 10 bandits by sending one new fighter per day for 100 days. You have 100 people, but you're basically wasting them because they will be all overcome by those 10 bandits. So we need at the beginning much more effort. But once you have built up this muscle strength, you'll be much better. And 15 minutes a day is, has been shown to be already quite a step in the right direction. And if you do that for six to eight weeks, even better. I mentioned these 14 hours, uh, 14 days at half an hour a day that we can already see a shift. But if you do only 15 minutes a day, but for eight weeks, much more impact. And so I'd like to close with one of my uh, intellectual heroes is Viktor Frankl, who was an Auschwitz survivor. Um, he is an Austrian psychoanalyst who said that actually everything can be taken from a man, but one thing. And this is the last of the human freedoms. It's the freedom to choose one's attitude in any given circumstance. And we have this freedom. We just need to grab it and take it. So with that, I would like to open up. And if you have obviously questions, you can contact me. Um, just to maybe a little side uh, pocket. And of course, my main passion 
and purpose is not only to talk about it, but also support people and groups and uh, to really build up this mental muscle that leads to mental fitness. Thank you very much for your kind attention. And we thank you so much again, Diego, for the really fantastic talk. Uh, it's always a pleasure to hear you. Um, thank you. Uh, yeah, no problem. Yeah, uh, please, please. Um, as, as you all saw in the chat, um, uh, uh, Valentin posted uh, the next event. So this Thursday, we have actually a follow up uh, with Diego on anxiety. Um, thank you for talking about uh, um, um, today's event on mental balance. And um, I also really, really love this analogy you bring up every time about uh, leprosy mm -hmm. and how you saw these people physically melting, but then you come to Switzerland and people uh, are physically healthy, but mentally melting, melting it. It kind of reminds myself. I, I, I use stronger words, rottening. Uh, rottening, yes, exactly. <laughs> it, 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 it kind of reminds uh, me of myself, actually. A, a few months ago, I was a PhD student writing my thesis, but mm -hmm. um, I'm really happy to, to hear the wonderful techniques you had today. And, um, and again, if people have some questions, uh, please raise your hand. Uh, we'll, we'll call on you. Or if you have any questions for Diego, please put into the chat. Aha. Uh -huh. well, one question was, I uh, just pick up the first one and please just keep filling them. All right. Yep. Um, ahead, Diego. Uh, or can you discuss the context of, yeah, please, why don't you, why don't you curate it? And then uh, I can, I can just focus myself uh, on yes. giving a, a okay. coherent so, answer. Thank you, Derek. Yes. So, so, so we, we, we have, we have um, one respondents as you saw. Um, uh, wondering if you can uh, um, define a bit the uh, context of meditation. Um, and uh, uh, of course, Mark brings up that he meditates while running uh, or doing physical activity. Um, is this equivalent to the type of meditation that you're talking about in your talk? No, it's not the same. Um, it's, it's certainly very beneficial to do. I, I myself do also quite uh, a lot of sports. I was even in the uh, national uh, selection in, in my youth. For, for rowing and I've been uh, ever since basically active uh, not to that degree but it's clearly something different it's you get into a state of basically a steady flow a steady uh, state by doing a physical exercise and and you keep it basically um, at that level but what you do not do is intentionally cultivate familiarity with the process of the mind and the cultivation of positive qualities. Now, meditation, I like to use a clear definition of what I understand as meditation. Meditation is not about just spacing out or being calm or being dull or being just basically uh, focused on an object and being absorbed there. This all can happen, but meditation uh, the Tibetan word that we translate as meditation is gom, and it literally means familiarization. And the Sanskrit word that we use, uh, that we translate as meditation is bhavana. And bhavana means fundamentally cultivation. So cultivation of what? It's cultivation of positive qualities of the mind. And I'm not talking about pleasant qualities of the mind. It's really positive qualities of the mind. And sometimes we have to do a little bit of unpleasant uh, engagement because we're actually lazy. So overcoming laziness is certainly unpleasant, but it has a positive effect because we're engaging in the cultivation and the training of positive qualities of the mind, such as focus, equanimity, joy, even impartiality or compassion and loving kindness. So that these are positive qualities. When we're talking about um, the familiarization process, what are we familiarizing ourselves with? We're obviously not familiarizing ourselves with the trail that we're running or on the bike, the road that we're going. It's really about the working of your own mind and it's an active process. It's a very focused, intentional process where you're looking at how does the mind respond, for instance, to abuse or to your own chatter or to your own uh, sabotaging process. So this is why meditation is more than just having a good time and being calm. It's an active process and it's uh, directional. Yep, thank you very much.
for for your for your nice answer and um, I think that uh, Johan uh, asked a, a similar question, so we're, mm -hmm. we're going to skip over that if, if, if that's okay, Johan. Um, it seems as if physical activity, um, as what Diego said, is, is of course important, um, but it's not quite the same as the uh, mental uh, meditation techniques that he was talking about. Mm -hmm. um, one person provided a private message um, about, though, trying to figure out how to get involved in meditation or to relax. Um, in particular, do you have any examples of a book or practice course app? that people can use that you would recommend? Yeah. The problem with the apps is you can't ask questions very rarely. And they're amazing. most of the time they can't the answers. So they're not really geared to you. The best thing is to really find a qualified teacher that can help you with where you are at at that very moment. And there are some communities that I can certainly recommend, other communities I cannot recommend, or even I can uh, disencourage people to go, because uh, it, it's key to be in, a, in an environment where you, which you can trust, because we're dealing with something very delicate. And of course, I provide uh, courses and workshops and even online platforms. So uh, I, I'm just throwing it out there. If, if there is an interest, then of course we can even build a, a, a community uh, to, to start looking at, at that. And of course in workshops, as well as uh, here in Zurich, I give also courses uh, or in, in the mountains, we have places where we do retreats. I would not recommend to start and then think you know it all by reading books. Books are a great additional supplement um, to um, guide you once you started in, in, in this process. But um, again, books, you can't ask questions. You cannot really uh, engage with them. But uh, there are maybe two or three books that I can recommend. One is by Mathieu Ricard. That's, uh, it's called Meditation and Happiness. These are two, two books that I can only recommend because they're really geared to uh, people in the context of our culture. Another group of uh, books that I can recommend is by Mingyur Rinpoche. That's uh, a Tibetan Lama that has authored some exquisite books around that. Um, then, of course, that's both are steeped in the Tibetan tradition. And then again, there are other traditions. There is the tradition of the Hindu tradition, then there are the traditions of Chan, and then uh, in, in Chinese context, and then also the Zen tradition. And then also the uh, practices in, in Beatenberg style of Vipassana. So it, it's really, you need to keep an open mind and explore. I think that's what I would, would answer to this question, explore. But then again, um, once you find somebody, go to somebody else and explore there. And then you go to somebody else and explore there. I, I really recommend not to just get stuck with one or two uh, sort of methods because it might something might be out there but once you have decided this is really for me then stick to it because otherwise you're just going to keep jumping from one to the other yeah as you said uh, focus is key so mm -hmm. um thanks for bringing that up and uh, as you probably see we've reached also the the, the 4 p.m mark um so so i'm happy if you do have a few more minutes to answer a few oh more absolutely I, I i booked i booked till uh half past but um, uh, j j just just in case if, if people are busy, uh, I understand if you need to leave. Um, but a quick a quick comment as well. Um, I know you, you just mentioned some resources. Um, we'll to everyone. We'll send out an email um, with with the books that Diego mentioned, um, the resources, and of course a link to his website if you want to talk contact him directly. Um, and also, uh, Diego, would it be okay if we share the slides that you presented today? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So yeah, uh, sure. Uh, I think it's the same slides that I. Uh, it's the same slides that I shared last time with you. So you can just sh share them. Go ahead, Eric. Oh, we just got lost. <laughs> looks looks like his internet connection broke for a moment. Oh. So I'll take over. I think we did not yet come to the question: What is the real difference between focus time, downtime, and time in? Yes. Yes. Uh, so, focus time is time when you really uh, dedicate, let's say, I need to write this report. 
And then you turn everything up. You turn up. This is what I do. I turn off my email. I turn off my phone. And I just spend two hours on writing this report. That's focus time, where you're really cultivating a safe environment in which you are able to do whatever you need to be doing in a focused way. Downtime is basically not having any task. It's a time when you just basically engage with whatever is there, uh, be that nature, be that um, when you go walking, when you're exploring, uh, when you're chatting, when you're not basically having a cognitive ongoing process, for example, or you're in an emotionally charged environment where, where you're basically doing something else than what you're doing normally. That's downtime, when you shift. Time in, however, is when you are taking, let's say, 15 or 20 minutes time for you and just spend it exploring inside. And of course, you need to have the tools and the methods and the techniques and even the technology to, to do that. But it's basically when you're really just looking inside. Oh, my mind is so messed up. It's so busy. It's restless. I'm confused. I'm tired. I'm, I'm sad. I'm happy. You really start exploring what's happening in you. And then with, with some time, you learn also how to bring your mind back. Because, and that goes into the next uh, question that is about mind wandering. When the mind has uh, the tendency to basically wander around. Now, it is important to mind wander. We cannot just be on target all the time. However, having said that, it is important to have focus mind wandering which means give yourself time now to wander. But most of the time when we're trying to, for instance, read something or when we are trying to write something, most of the time we have something else that is interfering. That's the mind wandering that is not very beneficial. So we need to learn to set time apart when we can mind wander. And something that I have been always very fascinated is by these um, at the time of quantum mechanics, when that was being developed with Bohr and Heisenberg and Pauli and, and all these, uh, and the dialogues that they were having among each other, as well as, as uh, Einstein, these were sort of heavy duty thinkers. They were constantly on target with their topic, but they clearly had times when they were disengaging, when they were basically having downtime from the process of thinking, and they were therefore reassociating existing concept in your manners. And if you look, read these autobiographies, the, their insights have all happened of the deeper understanding of, for instance, reality or the quantum mechanical processes were all happening outside of the normal thinking process. When they were walking on the beach, in the case of uh, Heisenberg, or when, when uh, Einstein was playing his violin, he was in a complete different set of mind, and it was a conscious mind wandering. So the biological sense and function of mind wandering is certainly given that it is exploring and creativity is mostly in that, that when you have set a, a space where you can really think existing ideas in new ways, then a new insight will come. But it needs to be, uh, in that sense, focused. It's really at the time when it's important. And I'm sure you all who are in, a, in the process of studying or are doing some research, observe closer how your mind actually works. And once you understand that actually Insights do not come when you're really grinding the mind. It's actually when you allow for it to be connecting in new ways, the existing dots. Thank you, Thank you very much for your answer, Diego. Um, I, I, have a, I have another private question from someone um, who uh, um, I guess you'll uh, understandably is private. Uh, we, we, we have a question about um, taking psychedelic substances uh, and, and what your thoughts are 
about taking psychedelic substances such as DMT, um, DMT yes. psilocybin uh, mm -hmm. to explore one's mind. Um, yeah. Um, well, these substances, to be very clear, are not really mind altering because they do not, and I have had serious discussions with people who are doing serious research around that. What they do, they shift your perception of existing structures and uh, all these substances are obviously you know, LSD or psilocybin or mescaline or, or DMT. They, they, they actually shift the perception from one sort of framework that you have. You all know that when you're under influence, for instance, even of alcohol, you, you suddenly start perceiving the world a little bit differently. The world is still somewhere out there, or you think it's out there, but because your perception of it is shifted. Now, the problem with these substances is that they can do a lot of shifting. And yes, that gives you new insights of, let's say, reality. The problem is it's not sustainable. And when it is uh, sustainable, it's my, most of the time psychotic. So that there, is, there, is dis, there is a challenge and also a risk of shifting too much. And I know there's also a lot around micro dosages, but most of the research where they're looking at contemplative practice, and meditation practices per se, uh, in the context of taking these substances, they are basically in a protected environment. And if you are in a protected environment, I am not against these substances because they really give you a new perspective. Most of the time, that can be, however, as I said, also a cause for other stuff to come up. So if you're not in a safe environment, if you're in, a, in an environment where you are, for instance, have had a lot of history uh, of stress or uh, of anxiety, that also comes up. And so we need to be very careful about that. So we, we also have um, another question, um, and we'll, we'll have two more questions, by the way. So this one, one more, then we'll, we'll close up the conversation. Mm -hmm. um, if anyone else has any questions, please feel free to contact Diego directly. Again, we'll send out an email with this information. Um, also, real quick comment, we have a survey um, uh, that we'd like you to fill out uh, with regards to how you think the event went, if you have any comments or feedback for us and Diego, um, for Fa Luces, for Miguel, and for Diego. Um, but yeah, without any further ado, uh, we have, um, would you have any advice, Diego, for what people can do before they go to sleep? Um, you know, relax. Mm -hmm. or... Well, certainly one of the things that we should avoid is uh, blue screens. I have set up my screen and I'm, I'm, I also have a tendency to be sort of workaholic, but two hours before my normal bedtime, my screen starts getting foggy. And that's great. Because I know now it's like okay, uh, the blue is getting is taken out, and this 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 app has really helped me a lot to move. Basically, getting ready. Oh, I think it's time for. If there's something urgent, I still sort of let it go for an hour. I can deactivate that thing. But that's that's one thing that I found extremely helpful for me. Also, what is important is again and again to take breaks. Smokers have it good. They have such an impulse that they walk away from the screen and go outside uh, in the fresh air uh, rather regularly. But why don't we do that, the non-smokers? So that also helps you to actually reconsolidate your mm, brain during daytime, which also has shown to be a very important uh, process of letting go before we go to sleep. Uh, another thing that in the research that we were doing was found is keep your feet warm have really warm feet because the body's delta and the feet is actually shifted towards warm feet is a great inducer to sleep so that's another one maybe fresh air maybe not fresh air that's secondary but certainly the warm feet are very important uh, and um, another thing that uh, has shown to be very useful is for instance uh reviewing all the great stuff that has happened during the daytime not the negative once you start feeling ah this, this person sucks or i failed here or this was not so good you start arousing again but just look at oh this was such a beautiful discussion we were having today i learned so much 
in this uh, exchange. And uh, that person uh, was such a kind, was showing kindness to me. All these so-called positive emotional attractor activating uh, ideas and conversations are very beneficial. But you need for that a trained mind. Thank you. And I think Valentin has a question. Yeah, um, as we have been talking so much about um, introspection, so looking in, inside yourself and also giving your mind space, um, is there a risk for people that uh, might suffer from some form of anxiety or depression that they start ruminating or that they enter their problem that way? So should we also say a couple of words of care that people do not, because they might try that out themselves without a teacher? <laughs> That's how people sometimes react. Um, and do we have to be careful that people do not like enter a stage where they get deeper in their issues? Of course. Um, it is it is a problem for people who have that tendency of ruminating and chewing and rechewing uh, sort of the negative talk. And this is why it's so key to develop a strength and a muscle to first and foremost bring awareness into that process. And once you have that, oh, okay, this is what I have a tendency, well, I need to do something else. And it's a bit challenging now in a, in a large group to say what is good for whom. Because every individual has, some people might be just having a low self-esteem. Others might be <clears throat> feeling a, a, a constant onslaught of their own thoughts. Uh, that's a different way how this needs to be dealt with. But certainly developing skills uh, in order to guide your own mind, you need to first and foremost have the skill of catching. And this is exactly what I will be talking on Thursday is this this how does that actually happen in your let's say brain but also in the mind and when that is happening how do we then start guiding ourselves uh, out of that and yes anxiety is one uh, depression is another one and also fears as well as uh, panic attacks that they're all basically fed not really if you look closely not really by what's happening outside it might be a trigger, but the actual process is happening within. And so how do we build that muscle strength around that? That's the question. And there are tools. And thank you again so much for the really nice uh, talk, Diego, and uh, for all the experience that you've been able to share with us. Um, again, I'd like to remind everyone um, that uh, uh, this Thursday, uh, we have another presentation by Diego, um, and we're really happy to have him back. Uh, and But for this event, uh, I'd like to um, have uh, everyone here, if you can, uh, thank Diego um, for, for the nice speech. Um, I know it's virtual, but feel free to, to clap if you like or provide us feedback. <laughs> and um, uh, without any other further ado, um, uh, we'll we'll uh, end this call. Um, I, I'd like to thank Faum Usis uh, for for 